Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Local Liberty. It is July 30th, 2015. I'm your host, Brian Saucier, and together with Shane Goodrich, we are going to continue the conversation about individual liberty in our community and abroad. In HD. Yes, folks, we're in HD now. We heard your complaints, and <laughs> now we are in HD. We only got one camera, but you can't get everything you want. Back to you, it's Brian. It's a dynamic environment. Yes. Growing, and changing, moving, always improving for you. <laughs> exactly. So I am going to start off, I'm going to dive right in uh, with a quote, and then we'll talk about what our segment will be about today. And you can probably guess after hearing this quote. So here it is. <clears throat> the world got compulsion schooling at the end of a state bayonet for the first time in human history. Modern forced schooling started in Prussia in 1819 with a clear vision of what centralized schools could deliver. Obedient soldiers to the army, obedient workers to the mines, well-subordinated civil servants to government, well-subordinated clerks to industry, and citizens who thought alike about major issues. That's a quote from a former school teacher in New York City, uh, a award-winning school teacher in New York City uh, by the name of John Taylor Gatto. Uh, he retired from teaching in 1990 or 91 and uh, since then has been uh, writing books, uh, giving lots of talks, uh, and all around inspiring many people uh, to learn a whole new meaning of what our public education system is. Uh, so that is going to be our topic for today. Um, to wrap things back into a little bit of what we've discussed uh, previously in some of our Essentials of Liberty series, we talked about in episode six, segment six of that series, we talked about what the state does in terms of what are some of the levers of control that the state uh, makes sure that it maintains its power over. Um, things like uh, uh, the roads, you know, anything to do with transportation, utilities, energy, communications, um, those are sort of the, the secondary levers of control. The two major levers of control are money. Uh, the, you know, the state has a complete monopoly on production of money. And then the, 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 the second major lever of control of our society is education. Uh, the state maintains a monopoly on education in the sense that there is only one system, the public education system, that we are all forced to pay for whether we think it's a good system or not. So that's going to be our topic for today. We're going to dive into uh, what the public education system is, uh, what it isn't, uh, and what, it's, uh, what it means to our culture, to our nation, to our society, and to all of us as individuals. Um, and, and one thing I'd like to uh, just make clear up front is we're going to talk about sort of a dual nature. Uh, we're going to, you know, things like I described the state having a dual nature in that the state is a system. Uh, but it's also the state is comprised of individuals working within that system, taking advantage of that system, uh, and some just plain uh, just earning a living as part of that system. So what we're going to talk about today is the educational system, not the individuals who are part of the system, not the individual teachers, not the individual administrators, not the students, not the parents. Uh, this, is, this discussion is going to be about the system as a whole. So... Uh, you know, this is not a con condemnation of the individuals that are part of that system. Like I always say, you're born into the society you're born into. You live in the society as the society exists now. There's, there's la certain laws or certain institutions. You're forced to deal with those institutions whether you like it or not. We can talk about uh, some magical utopia where things are a, a different way. But they're not. They're this way, so people are, have to live in that system that, as it is. We, we want to change that system, but that's the system as it is now. So as Brian just discussed, we're not, we're not condemning the teachers that are in the system. A lot of those teachers, they want to be there. They're good, te they're good people. They're trying to do their job. And they're forced by strange bureaucratic rules and regulations to not be able to actually do their job. They can't, they, they, they can't be a good teacher because of the X rule. They can't do this because of that rule. Then they have Common Core and all these other bizarre things that prevents them from doing and executing their job of teaching. Yep. So uh, we're going to talk about that in, uh, in a little more detail. And, and just to note, this is probably going to be a two-part uh, 
topic. Uh, this will cover two episodes because there's a lot to say here. So I don't think we're going to get through it in one hour. So uh, we hope you will stick with us for both uh, segments of this series, and uh, we hope you learn something from it. Um, so okay, so let's let's really dive in. Uh, something that we you hear about a lot in our town, certainly overall in the national system, everybody likes to talk about. You know, it's it's not controversial to say the public school system is failing. Um, it's not it's not doing what it should be doing for for students. It's not doing X. It's not doing Y. It's totally uncontroversial to say the system is failing, and it's we got to fix it. We got to fix it, and to um, to determine whether or not something is failing, you have to define its success criteria, um, and you also have to. And this is one of the the uh, you know this is always something you have to keep in mind when you're evaluating anything in life. Uh, you have the you have the seen versus the unseen. You have the the stated intentions of a of any given system, and then you have the actual intentions of the system. And and it's important to not just accept verbatim what you're told as the stated intentions of any of anything and especially something as profoundly important as the system that that educates all of our children especially since a lot of times the language these politicians are using is very vague and uninformative it's just it's failing we need to fix it we need to make things better okay can you give me some more detail on how you could do that uh, 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 we have to give more money or uh, make teachers better trained. It's always very vague. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no real specifics you can latch on to. And, and like you said, they don't, they don't give you criteria for what is success. Right. I don't know. So the, um, the, uh, I, I should have put this in here, but at the very highest level going back, you know, 100 years of what are the stated criteria of the stated success criteria officially of the public school system, it's to create good people to create good citizens and, and to and to ensure that everybody can be their best those are the those that's that's very close to what the three stated goals of the public education system were now what we're going to be talking about today is is really turning that upside down and saying that no the the public education system is not failing at all it is extremely successful. It's one of the most successful systems mankind has ever come up with. And that's because the actual purpose of the system is light years away from its stated purpose. So, so, to, so, so, to, so to sort of to get to, the, um, to, uh, to drive towards this a little bit more, I got a few, another couple of quotes from you from Mr. Gatto. The first is, uh, schools are intended to produce, through the applications of formulas, formulaic human beings whose behavior can be predicted and controlled. That's pretty much a one-sentence, very high-level statement of purpose for the public education system, is to create a population that is controllable, that is predictable, that's manageable. So when you go back to, is the system failing or is it succeeding? Well, again, measure it against its its true purpose, not its stated purpose. And you can say, okay, this system is quite successful. Uh, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit there. I think its true purpose, it has no true purpose. There is no really well-defined purpose. You, you say this is what is actually happening, and I agree it is what's actually occurring, but I'm not sure if you ask anyone that's part of that system that this is their goal. They'll say it's a different goal, and because the system is a disaster, a bureaucratic mess, and everyone's at odds with each other, they can't actually reach any, any goals that they want, and it ends up turning into this other thing, but, that is, which is just terrible. That's, but that's the difference between the individual and the system. The individuals, the individuals within the system may have very, um, very good goals, you know, goals that are uh, very moral, very just goals, uh, very honorable goals. That's the individuals in the system. The system itself is an entirely different and separate beast. The and, system doesn't have any goals. It's not a thinking agent. There is no goals. It's but, the goals are the goals of the individuals the in the system. But the system has been created by individuals over the course of the last 150 years, our system today. And right. these guys, I have some of this written in here uh, straight out of their books. What I just stated as, as these goals, 
they have said this explicitly, almost verbatim in writing. I understand that, but those again, those are just individuals with a, with a, within a system. So why why would you prioritize their viewpoint for what it is versus these other people's viewpoints? Because, I think the problem is because the, because another, the conflict. Well, because another fundamental element of the system is it's created as a as a pyramid, in that. It is meant to be top-down, centrally controlled, centrally driven. So what you just mentioned a few minutes ago about the individual teachers may have honorable goals, but their, their goals are totally overwhelmed by the systemic initiatives that have been rolled up and set up over the course of, of hundreds of years. And really the history goes back thousands of years. And we, you know, probably in the second part of this we'll very briefly trace that, but I think it's really important to separate the institutional systemic level parameters which carry the weight of hundreds of years of people being involved, some of them not good people or very misguided people who had misguided goals a hundred years ago and these things still count. And these are guys that, you know, their names are still on the uh, on you know places of honor in, 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 in Harvard. Like there's there's lectures and there's whole halls that are named after some of these people so they were not and, and, and almost you say to their credit maybe they, their intentions weren't evil back then I think, because I think what they ma were what matters were here is we, with it. we we agree with this what the system is actually doing do you how you want to label what the system wants to do I, I don't think that's relevant as much to the fact what's actually happening this is what's occurring regardless of what any individual within the system or administrator or bureaucrat says public edu public education is for well we're going to tell you what actually is happening in the public education system because a lot of these because you, you ask a lot of these people directly well is it for these stated goals you just named they'll go no 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 it's not about that it's about uh, creating uh, happy people for people that can blah 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 and they'll give you other goals and trying to parse who's lying, who's telling the truth, what, what is the real purpose behind the scenes, I don't think it's that important. What's important is what actually well, occurs right. in the public what's, education system. The, the way you parse who's lying and who's not, or who's right or who's wrong, is you sit back and you objectively look at the results. Right. And, um, okay, so and that's, that's what we're going to do uh, to a certain extent. But before we go into that, I've got another quote. Uh, this is drawn heavily on, on John Gatto's work. Um, I got another quote from one of his books. This is all. Most of these quotes are from uh, "Dumbing Us Down," one of his first books. Um, and this is a this is a little a couple of sentences about what education, what real education should be, as opposed to schooling. <clears throat> so, whatever an education is, it should make you a unique individual, not a conformist. It should furnish you with an original spirit with which to tackle the big challenges. It should allow you to find values which will be your roadmap through life. It should make you spiritually rich. A person who loves whatever you are doing, wherever you are, whomever you are with, it should teach you what is important, how to live and how to die. So, that is a very, very broad defin definition of education. I want to be a teacher one day. I wouldn't use that definition. For the purpose of an educator, the purpose of a teacher is to teach whatever particular subject they're doing in the way that's most effective for the student. Now, this other stuff about 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 life and making you a better person, this what the public education system does, it, it prevents that from happening because it gets involved in things that it shouldn't be involved in. Uh, it's it's more of a hindrance, really. So, so I think it's about the difference between do you want to be a educator or do you want to be a schooler? If you have a particular a particular subject that you want to train people on do you want to be an instructor like you know i can go to a i can go to a training course in the it world and i have an instructor who teaches me very particularly how to uh how to administer certain computer systems right that's what a teacher um, does but that's I teach, I teach you martial arts i teach you how to play, play instrument i teach you u.s history but that's, i teach you various things right, but, in the most effective yeah, way but possible that's sort of uh that's sort of core to the message that, that guys like uh like john gatto are are expressing that Education is something different. It's about creating whole people who have a, a, it's about fostering our own natural curiosity, our own individual desire to, to become full and complete humans. And that's, and that's nothing to do with teaching somebody a particular subject. So it's, he's, he's got, and, and this is hard for me sometimes to grasp.
but he's got a much more holistic perspective. And his angle is about giving children experience, not instructing them. So if he wanted to teach them about how, I think as an example from his books, about how a city is run, it's, okay, kids, town hall is two miles away. Go walk to town hall and hang out there for a couple hours. Take some notes, observe, and I'll see you in six hours. That was education. Teaching or instruction would be, here's what the textbook says about how town hall runs. No, brr, that's, brr, that's, brr, no brr. that's not true. That's definitely not true. I'm going to college right now. I'm a public educator at the Mill Museum. I know a lot of good teachers. What you just said, that's, that's bad education. That is not teaching in a way that will actually... Um, Get, get people to learn the skills. Right. That's the thing I'll be, I don't and, and, like. The rote learning, the one-size-fits-all model is terrible. And what, and right? what are you but, typically but, but you're, you're talking? You're, but you're talking about a, a, a very broad definition of education. I wish I could think of the, uh, the philosopher's name right now, but um, I was reading uh, someone who wrote a, an article about education, and ah, it's an Indian philosopher, and he's basically the exact same thing we're talking about right, right here. But to me, this, this, this is making the, 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 the definition so broad is to start to you start to lose perspective on what you're talking about because now it's 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 encompassing too many things. When you start to encompass too many things in a definition, the definition loses its power because I can't define something unless I can have very clear criteria. This is very broad and vague criteria which anyone could use to twist in any way they want. I think. Well, I think that's the point. It's broad in the sense that you know what does he say in the first sentence? It's about unique individuals. Every single unique individual is going to have a different definition of what they want to learn, what they should learn, what's important sure. to them, what they value. Sure. So an educational and as a teacher, system should encompass individuals. And right. the only way you can do that is by being highly decentralized. So we're kind of way ahead of, of, of where I wanted to go with, with this presentation, but I think... Appreciating the difference between education and schooling is um, is sort of core to, to what, to what I'm trying to get across. Education is learning, and you have educators that help you learn. And their goals help you learn what you want. The problem with the public school system and this unique individual thing here is, like, yes, I'm a unique individual. If I have a student, uh, uh, or if I have someone that comes to the Mill Museum and I'm giving a tour, I don't just cram down some some script I, I give them, oh, here's my script. I don't care who you are, I'm just gonna give you the script. No, I find out where are you interested? What do you want to know? How can I help better your life? Tell me the, the things you wanted to talk about. I'll talk about them with you. What, what strategies you, you, do you prefer to learn in? Do you, would you like me to demonstrate this equipment? Would you like to give me a lecture? Do you wanna have a back and forth dialogue? And how That's many, the point of a right, teacher. And how many times did you have that conversation with your K through 12 teachers? That didn't happen. Didn't happen. So Terrible. Terrible. One size fits all. Model. So that's that's schooling. But but I see. Now, I'm in college now, and that's not always the case in college. In the college well, system, there is more. There's some. There's a few fundamental differences. One, there's adults in college, right. primarily young adults, maybe not entirely grown up, but they're adults. Well, I'm in mean, community college too, so it's, the thing is, it's a right. wide range. You have people that know what they want. There is no law compelling you yes. to go You're to right. a college, and. There's no law saying if your parents don't send you to a college, somebody's going to knock on their door and say, you're in trouble now. And also at um, community college, mo most of the professors there, they don't have tenure. So they, don't, they can't just do a half ass job and go, oh, yep, I just phoned this class in. I'll just have my T TA teach it. I'll just, here's the textbook. Read it. And here's an exam. No, they have to do a good job if they want to keep getting classes. So there's an incentive for them to do good. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. So, and okay. this is all semantics. So let's, 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 so let's, let's go to the K-12 thing. Let's move on. Mm -hmm. on um, I've got another piece that's, that's drawn directly from, uh, from John Gatto's uh, Dumbing Us Down. And, and this was, again, this was the first book he wrote after retiring from uh, being a, a school, a, a public educator or a school teacher for 30, almost 30 years in New York City. I, I want to read and, this because I'm really interested in, in public education and it's educating a, people. It's a great read. It's, he's, got, he's got lots of reads. I do. You're, you're welcome to it. There's, um, so, so, what, so this is what he did when he, uh, when he, right after he retired. This is one of the first books he wrote. And part of this first book is he has the first chapter. is called The Seven Lessons School Teacher. So, he, so he, he conveys what his 
um, again, like, so his direct experience when he said, okay, this is what I did as a school teacher. So again, this is not coming from me. This is copied mostly verbatim from a, from a, from a school teacher. But I can confirm this from personal experience. So, um, so lesson number one is confusion. Um, a, a teacher, uh, it, it each has their own, their own particular subjects, and the students overall are, are just taught how things don't relate. They're given bits of facts over here to memorize, bits of facts over there to memorize. They're scored on how well they do or do not memorize them. What they're not taught is how, <clears throat> excuse me, how any of this is relevant to, to, their, to the real world, to an mm. adult world. Almost never. And, and, and the end result is of all this siloed material that's disconnected, deliberately unconnected, like the bell rings, run to the next, next subject, is you just have kids that grow up confused. They grow up with, you know, what, what am I going to do when I grow up? I mean, how, how many kids go to college now, not a clue what they want to do, because they haven't been shown anything about how the real world operates. They don't have any real experience of being out in the world serving other people, earning money from other people, volunteering for this, volunteering for that. And I, I know there's this very superficial layer of, you know, if you're going to get into a good college, you do your 20 hours of community service or whatever. But that's all entirely canned experience. It's not about just getting out there and seeing how the world works. It's also works. only for a small percentage of students. The vast majority mm -hmm. of students that I knew, me included, we never had any of that. There was, there was the elite <laughs> students that, had, that performed well on the test, that followed the the, the guidelines that, that were obedient and came to school to class and raised their hands when they, had, when they wanted to talk and did everything right and they got to go on the special trips. They got to do the special stuff. The other people that were outside the box may want to do things a different way. Nope, back to your seat. Go to the office, you. That's what happened. So I mean, that ties into, so, that, so the first lesson was confusion. Which I was what, always what, confused. What Shane uh, just mentioned ties into the second lesson of, 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 the, of the school teacher. And that is to teach class position. <laughs> And it's to know, to know your place in society. And you have the, as Shane just mentioned, you have the, you got the good kids, you have the bad kids. Um, you got the, the high performing classes, you have the low performing classes, and you got the average classes. And one of the things that, um, that the author mentioned, I forget which book, but I found it really, really profound, is he said in his 30 years of teaching, he never met <clears throat> what would be termed a gifted student. And he never met a, uh, whatever the official PC term is, for the opposite of a gifted student. Uh, he, he, he said, like, you know, there's, there's no such thing. Like, there's, there's individuals. There's, there's, there's kids. And, and they, they all have, uh, you know, there's, sure, there's going to be varying levels of talents. There's going to be varying levels of this and varying levels of that. They're all, we're all different. But this whole notion of grouping and lumping and ranking and organizing and you could say yeah you know life is about competition but the artificial ranking and competition schemes in schools the net result is just to teach kids it's, it's our own little version of a caste system really yeah. and it's to teach you your class position yep. and you you get assigned your class and and the the vertical mobility in a school is not there it's not like the american dream where anybody can work hard and work their way up that really isn't how 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 things work in a public school system. And I, I remember Once I loved you get pigeonholed the, in the in the lower classes. Well, you're you're probably there to stay. Yeah, because if you're in the if you're in the I forget, I forget what the euphemistic, euphemistic terms they use. But I remember when I was young, I'm like, oh, okay, this is. The, these these vague terms like oh I, I get what this actually means right. and once you get put in whatever the bottom level is well now you're just trash and who cares about these people we're only going to focus on the whatever the tier one whatever whatever it is their the term they're using those are the students we put the money into those are the students that get to go on those trips not the, the ones in you know level three or whatever however they, they classified it mm -hmm. and like you said once you got put in a group but often it was hard to, to change the group, you just you just keep get, keep getting put in that group, but and it's sort of it's kind of like a self fulfilling prophecy in some ways. Um, so that was number two. Number three um, of uh, you know the, of, of the seven lesson school teacher. The third lesson that a teacher uh, instructed his students on is indifference, and, and this is one that that really rang true with me. Thinking back to my experience, is basically whenever the bell rings, you're trained. You drop everything you're doing. No matter how important it is, no matter how enthralling it is, you could be on the most engrossing 
learning experience of your lifetime. And ding, the bell rings. Bye, kids. See you tomorrow. So basically, what does that teach kids after 15,000 hours of that over 12 years that nothing is really important? That you can, th there's nothing worth really committing your time and energy and passion to because the bell's just going to ring. The bell's going to ring, and maybe you'll bring about, maybe you'll bring it up tomorrow, maybe you won't if the teacher's lesson plan has moved on. That's not how my workflow is. When I work on uh, the local liberty, when I do my documentary work with the Mill Museum, when I'm working on any task, it's not this rigid, here's 45 minutes. Oh, I had an epiphany at 44 minutes. Oh, but no, 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 no. We'll right. save that for next day for 45 minutes. No, you work when you have the enthusiasm. Oh, I can do it this way. Excellent. Let's, let's pursue this goal while I have the energy to do it. Let's be, let's be productive while I have that time. <laughs> Not be put into these this strange arbitrary boxes. I mean, I do like to have order in my life, but just, just, just sticking that order for the sake of order is just ridiculous. Yep. And, and that's what it is. It's just yeah. it's for the sake of it's just because yep. we and do it because. A, yep. And there's a couple other elements to that uh, of, of the of the indifference in, in terms of and this sort of relates to the the uh, the previous lesson too about class position is the whole notion of age segregation, age ranking. The ten year olds are for the most part kept strictly separate from the eleven year olds and the twelve year olds and the nine year olds <gasps> and the six year olds. That's and, so scary. They can't mix because the horror, the horror. Right. And basically, what it's Teaching kids is to be afraid of people that are older than you and ignore and look down upon the people that are younger than you. Yeah. So, and this is a, a, a really unnatural thing to like, when else in the course of your life are you surrounded by people that are only your exact same age? But here's not, the thing though. Not in your career, not in an office, not in a career. Here's, not what, in here's what happens. And I, and I see this with um, some people I work with, uh, my other team show, Geeks at the Movies. Um, they mostly only are ever around people their own age. And they're still in the school system, right? Yeah. But as soon as I got out of the school system, suddenly it's like, you're right. Wait a second. There's people that aren't my own age in the world. Oh, I can't believe it. Uh, the, uh, right. It, it's, an, uh, it's a strange experience for you because you've never had that. Yep. But when you're in the real world, you work with people of all different ages. Right. And it just creates this really unnatural disconnection with the past and the present. Yes. Because, you know, you... You know, you're, you're fresh out of college. You start your career, and you're working along some guy that's 55 years old. He's your, he could be your, your boss or your peer or your manager, your colleague. Or, and it just, it just it's, again, it's going towards making people unprepared for real life. That is part of what school is. Oh, I can't believe there's people that are different than me out here. Yep. It's, it's unbelievable. It, it's astonishing. I mean, more the school I went to, I mean, it was even worse because they had – they, they didn't use this term, but this, this is the reality. They had segregation. They had separate but equal. Where I went, when I went to elementary school, I went to Natchaug Elementary School in Willimannock. Now, if you live in Willimannock, you might know we have a fairly large uh, population, Mexican population. I didn't know Mexicans existed when I was in elementary school because they all were in their own wing. They were segregated from everybody else. And then finally, when the segregation ended with this, this, these confused ideas of, uh, I mean, they, they wanted to, to these people because they didn't speak English natively. They thought, oh, well, if we just teach them in Spanish, it would be better for them. But then they never learned English. By the time they got into sixth grade, they stayed among, amongst themselves. I remember finally in, in high school, I finally uh, uh, became friends with Mexican. Finally, I barely had any contact with them. And, and he was telling me how strange it was. He's like, it was really weird. It's like, we used to see all the other people, but we'd only go to these rooms. And then when you guys had a recess, we wouldn't go there. And then at lunch table, we'd only sit with our special teachers. He said it was such a strange experience for him. He's like, wherever I'm outside with my mom walking around with Mac, I see all kinds of other people. But whenever I went to school, it was just, everyone was like Mexican immigrant and their parents were Mexican. It was so strange. It was a bizarre thing. It, just, it doesn't make any sense. And they said it was for, you know, I mean, they got, they got rid of the bilingual education program, I think, in California, mm -hmm. because it doesn't work. Kids will learn the language. We had this French uh, um, exchange student. He came into our class in fourth grade. He didn't speak any English. But they just threw him in there because they didn't have a French bilingual program. You know what happened in a few months? He spoke English, and he integrated, and everything was fine. He was motivated. But it, it wasn't even motivation. It was, you have to. That's a great motivator. Right, exactly. But here... And the idea is, well, we want, we want to make sure that, they, that, they can, that people can learn and speak another language. And I understand that, that concept. I'm not against speaking other languages. I think it's great being multilingual. But the problem is this method they're using, the separation method, doesn't help anyone. 
because not only did it keep the, the, the Mexican population separated, but also kind of engendered a, a kind of light racism uh, between like uh, some of the Mexican students and they'll say the white students because they just didn't know each other. They were the other. Mm -hmm. well, that's the, those are the other people because it wasn't integrated. They weren't just like you're saying with, with the with the age. It's like whoa, this person's four, four years older than me. Oh, he, he's he's not me. It's yep. very weird it's and unnatural. unnatural. Yes, it's unnatural. Um, it's it's totally repugnant to how families are. Yeah. Unless you happen to be everybody's quadruplets, you know, in a family, <laughs> you, there's going to be people of different ages. You're going to have to hang around with. That's life. Okay, so um, so we covered the, the first three lessons, you know, confusion, class position, and indifference. Uh, the fourth lesson of a, of, uh, of a school teacher is emotional dependency. And this sort of ties into, we already covered some of this, the fact that in the school system, individuality does not exist. It can't exist. The system is designed to be one-size-fits-all, um, Top down, centralized control. Uh, you can't, that, a system like that, you know, by definition, does not support individuality in any meaningful sense. They beat it out of you. It's the only bad, way. Bad, bad, bad you. Don't express your individual feelings. Bad, you're terrible. It's the only way you can have, you know, th the environment can run. Uh, besides individuality, rights do not exist. This is something that you can see very. You know, th there's no debating this. This is like, you know, th th our good old Supreme Court has ruled that students officially have no rights. A student, like, the, the right of free speech, which we all hold dear, doesn't exist in a school. Um, you know, privacy rights, property rights, none of these things. These are officially, no questions asked, do not exist in, in a school system. And, again, this is, uh, this is training for kids. Um, you, you're not an individual. You have no rights. Everything that happens in school is a that everything that you may like or anything good. It's a privilege. It's not a right if you're in school, and that all privileges are granted solely at the discretion of some centralized authority. Whether that authority is the teacher in the classroom, or the principal, or the hall monitor, or or anybody. Anything you want to do is a privilege. If you want to take a leak. You need to get a written permission. You need, you need a hall pass to go down to the, the bathroom and empty your bowels. So what are we trying to instill in our young people with that kind of environment? I'd say, well, I, I'd say the emotion, you know, dependency, our happiness, our freedom is dependent on somebody else. That's and, lesson four. And me, that one seems pretty clear. And it's arbitrary, too, I would say. Because I can imagine some reasonable rules. Well, the rules are just rules because they're rules. It's like um, the zero, zero tolerance policy. What the hell? Who came up with the zero tolerance policy? It, may, it takes no account of individuality. It takes no account of the actual situation that's occurring. It's like, you broke this rule. Look, 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 here's, let, me, let me look at the code. See, 563.1. You can't have this. That's that. I don't care about anything about the situation. The situation is completely irrelevant. This rule right here, so now you're kicked out of school or, or now you're punished in some other way. It's so ridiculous. One size fits all policies, Brian, they don't work. They don't work in real life, they don't work anywhere. Chew a Pop-Tart into a shape of a gun or a letter L, zero tolerance. Whoa, whoa, calm down there, Brian, with that talk. <laughs> calm down, I might have to call the authorities on you. The authorities. Okay, lesson number five, intellectual dependency. Um, all success that you have in the school environment comes at the sole discretion, again, of an authority figure, of the grades you get. Your, your intellectual capacity, your, your intellectual worth is graded down to the single percentage point. Johnny is a 91, but Ralph is only a 72. Oh, poor oh, Ralph. Poor Ralph. So, and what is, the, what is the real lesson from all this? It's not just to make Ralph feel like he's worthless. It's to make Ralph and Johnny get used to having the experts, the experts tell them what to do. And think about how that, how that, how that parlays into, your, into our adult life when we, for the most part, are all too happy to let an expert technocrat 
make our decisions for us to decide this is how much of your income you're going to get to keep or this is how our you know this is how policy x y and z is going to be it's all going to be handled by the experts people accepting so-called experts to run their lives starts when you teach intellectual dependency in a classroom where your worth only comes from the single digit percentage point ranking that you get from a stranger the stranger may be your teacher or, or, or some other person and again this is a one-size-fits-all model because children develop at different rates but if you happen to be uh, maybe develop a little slower and you, it doesn't matter if you catch up later with the, with the other class but because you started off slower oh you've already been labeled as one thing then and it makes it more difficult to move past that mm -hmm. Um, so, so that was uh, number five, and we've already sort of stepped on uh, number six, um, which, you know, number four and five, emotional dependency and intellectual dependency, basically lead to number six, which, is, which, which he calls uh, provisional self-esteem, which again comes down to your self-worth is wholly dependent on a report card that gets sent home that, that teachers may or may not put a whole heck of a lot of thought into. Um, now it's, basically, they have tenure. it's a bunch of numbers that get sent home and your parents can know, again, down to the single percentage point, how happy or how mad they should be with you. And, and I remember thinking this when I was a kid, and, and, I, and my experience in school was, you know, fairly successful, I guess, to use that word, in the sense of what the institute, you know, of what the public school system is. Uh, but I remember thinking, you know, this is my job. This is what I'm, this is what I'm, this report card, this is me. Like, I get to feel like I've done something when I've just got this piece of paper with, with some scratches on it. So that, so. From um, a young age, they teach you that fancy piece of paper matters. Yep. That now even the college system, it's all about credentialing because you want to get that fancy piece of paper because you know you can't do a job unless you have a fancy piece of paper. Well. I mean, I can't make this TV show without a fancy piece of paper, right? I mean, obviously, I must have one because we can't do this otherwise. You have to have a fancy piece so, of paper, folks, to do anything. The fancy piece of paper only matters while you're stuck or choose to be within the artificial world of academia. Once you get out of that world, fortunately, there's still enough sanity in the private employment sector that people do not care about your fancy pieces of paper. But it doesn't matter. And they do Be not care about the numbers on the paper either. But it, but it doesn't matter if they care or not in some cases because the government has passed laws. You cannot be this. You cannot be that. You cannot right. be this unless that's, you have the fancy piece of paper. That's, that, in that case, that fancy piece of paper is called a license. Right. It's a credentialing um, system. It's right. not an education. I, the people that go to like, the college and the classes I'm in, most of them don't give a damn about what they're learning. They're there to get this fancy piece of paper so they can do the job that they actually want to do. For example, there's a lot of people... Uh, at Quinnebog Valley Community College that they want to be nurses. So like I'm, I'm in a class for like anthropology or web design or, or public, or all these things. I'm like, why does this person have to be in this class that they want to be a nurse? What does this have to do with being a nurse? And of course, you ask them what they learned the next semester. Like I talk to my fellow students. I go, oh, remember that history class you took about this, this, and that? And like, uh, I, no, because they didn't care. They were only doing it because they wanted the credential for the fancy piece of paper. But if we just cut all that out, it, things would be a lot cheaper. People could focus on the goals that they want to focus on. And it's the same if you go to the public school systems for, for K through 12. If you force feed all these things on people and let them pursue their own interests, they'll get better at them because they're actually interested and they'll be more productive citizens in the real world. Mm -hmm. Yep, so that brings us to the, our, last, our last lesson from the, in the seven lesson school teacher. And this one I think is, is really interesting because he wrote this in 1990 um, or 91. And the, and the, the last lesson is, about, is that you cannot hide. There is no privacy. You are always under surveillance in a school system. There is always somebody around. If you're seen wandering around in the, in the hallway, somebody's going to say, hey, what are you doing out here in this hallway? You're in front of a teacher in the classroom. You're in front of a bunch of people watching over you in the, uh, in the lunchroom, out in the ball field for gym class, or whatever the case may be. You are taught that there is nowhere to hide. And I tried and hiding. Me and my friend in first grade, <laughs> we went into the walk-in closet and we barricaded it. We put a vacuum cleaner up there. We put a bunch of stuff up there. And we're like, yes, Mrs. Bazzani, or whatever her name was, she can't get us now. And I'm sure you bang. got somebody's attention. Bang, bang, bang. Shane! 
I know you're in there. Get out. No, then they found us. Yep. And then we had to go to the principal's office. You've been bad. Bad news. <laughs> so bad news. Think about, and this is where, this one, this is one that really struck me as what fruit do these lessons bear long term? That in, you know, in 1990, he's writing this book where he just spent 30 years as a teacher teaching kids that they can't hide. And what is the long term fruit that that bears? In fast forward to 2013, and there's all these revelations about how the government is collecting information on everything we do online in a digital fashion and, and really not even online anything you do electronic the government is collecting it and cataloging it and really the outcry i mean there was a lot of people that were upset but the nsa is still around um you know no, ver none of these programs got changed most not of the, one of them most folks 99 like, percent of the patriot act is still in play yeah. people are like oh they got rid of the patriot act no they didn't get rid of the patriot act most of the Patriot Act is still in play. I'll replace it with the Freedom Act. Oh, oh, oh my mistake, Brian. The Freedom Act. <laughs> uh, Another great euphemism. Right. Or I may be, no, I may be mistaken the Patriot the, Something to do with the NSA. and the, Yeah, it was the Freedom Act. It's going to have some yeah. ridiculous name like that. Because yeah, the Patriot Act is a ridiculous name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was one that really struck me as, you know, when you train kids for 15,000 hours with these lessons, even the ones that, you know, that, that fought the whole way and rebelled and were labeled as the bad students, they could have been brilliant or whatever, those, we still carry these lessons with us, subconsciously even. And what um, I learned was, so, event, so the closet thing didn't work. So when I got older, we'd go to the computer lab and we'd play Warcraft 2. Like, and then when someone would come in and ask what we were doing, oh, we got a, we got a pass from some teacher. Uh, eventually, they caught on to this. So then what would, what would I learn? The only way to hide from them is like, hey, we'll just go out the back door and, and skip class and not go to school today. That's what happened. So I just yep. dropped out of high school. Until eventually, fast forward to today, and this is you know a post-9-11 thing, but I think it really accelerated after uh, some school shootings and stuff. Schools are literally on lockdown. You, the door is locked. You can't leave the building. Um, like yeah, schools, you're right. I don't know if I, if I actually would have been able to do that can't, today. No, you can't you do that. And I remember even when I was in high school in the 90s, um, you were still relatively free physically to come and go. Yes. Uh, you could. I just walked right out the door. Security guard said, hey, hey, hey. See you right. later. Now the door is locked. And if, if you try to leave the school, somebody is going to stop you. Wow. That, that, that to me is scary. <laughs> that is. That, that's, that's, what, prison. that's prison. That's prison. <laughs> what? An awful lot of parallels. That might be a topic. For an, that's, a, that's a topic for another discussion. And if parallel. school wasn't so horrible, maybe I wouldn't have wanted to leave. But because it was so horrible, because it was a one-size-fits-all model, because it couldn't actually cater to individual needs, well, see you later because I'm an individual. Treat me as an individual. Treat me as someone that knows what they want to do, knows what they want to pursue, and help me achieve those goals. Don't help me achieve the goals you want to achieve because that doesn't help me. It doesn't help anybody. Don't force you top down from your bureaucrat to decide this is what's good for you, this is what's bad for you, this is what's no, that doesn't work. Let people be individuals and pursue their own goals. But the people that set up the public school system want to do exactly that. It's about initiating on a, on a mass crowd control level ways of controlling somebody else for their benefit. You know, now that, now that I think about it, there is a strong segment of people, and I've, I've heard this, this, these arguments about homeschooling. Because I was thinking about you know public school systems and and are there those people that really don't want to control people? It just popped in my mind. Wait a second. There's a whole group of people that are against the homeschooling movement, and they want as much as they possibly can to get into um, like you homeschool your kids. They want to get into your life and how to raise your kids. They want to have bureaucrats come down to your house and test you. That is scary. Go away now. Get away from me, you crazy person. Go deal with your own your own sphere. Don't deal with my sphere. This is, this is me. Well, we're not going to have time to get to it today, but one of the things we're going to discuss in the second episode is straight, straight out of a guy's book that he wrote in the early, like 1918, a, a guy from Harvard wrote a book about the secondary education system, talking about high school. And he lays out his six, these are the six purposes of, uh, of the system. And some of the stuff is it's almost it's surprising that people would be willing to put this in writing but it's it's all there it, you know it, this is like this hiding in plain sight basically is is the real history and purpose of the public school system oh and one thing we should mention if you're watching this on tv on charter 192 
when the, if this is airing and you're watching on TV, go to our YouTube channel, Local Liberty. Just put it in quotes in the search bar. You'll find Local Liberty. And we'll probably already have episode two, part two of this up. So if you're, you just checked us out at, at uh, 8.30 every Thursday and went, oh, it's 9.30 now. Well, I really want to see the second part. Oh, I have the internet. And you'll find it there. Good point, Shane. Thank you. So, okay, so we just went through the seven lessons of, uh, of, a, of a public school The teacher. seven deadly lessons and, and of the public is, school yep, and this And <laughs> this is from, this, this is, you know, this is not my, you know, this is not my original thoughts here. This is, comes from a public school uh, teacher that lived this for almost 30 years. Uh, you know, and those, those seven lessons were confusion, class position, indifference, emotional dependency, intellectual dependency, provisional self-esteem, and constant surveillance. Those are the seven lessons. And that ties back into when I said be before, we're going to say, is the school system failing? Well, is the school system, that's again, is it failing on its stated purposes or is it failing on its real purposes? And I'd say on its real purposes, which I, I, I'm in agreement with the author that if the real purposes of, of schooling are closer to are much closer to these seven lessons that he lays out rather than the the the, 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 the lofty goals of of you know of teaching everybody to be the best person they can be. It's also know. different when because when we're talking about younger people compared to like say like I, I talk about college and here it's like teach me the subject I'm interested in help me be, become better at audio engineering at web design at, at being a history whatever, whatever it is. You know, it's, it's, it's a little different when you're teaching very young students. That's light with, years away. Right, exactly. From taking a five-year-old and saying, you need to turn him over for 40 hours a week to this system, and you need to pay for this system whether you like it or not. And unless you, uh, and, and, and unless you show us otherwise that you're sufficiently educating them, we're going to consider him truant. And then you're going to be there's going to be you're going to be under some legal liability. That that is, um, I don't have kids. Brian has kids. But as you as you tell me these things, I'm trying to I'm trying to imagine me having kids, and it it's just that's so scary. It's like what are you insane? It's look, look, it's I'm going to give you some. I want to give my cat puzzles to random strangers for 40 hours. No chance in hell. How, how could you? T it doesn't make any sense. I just don't that, see how you could do that. That's it's one so of the scary. Things, that's one of the things that's on for, for our second episode I mean, is but, talking about the essence of tr strangers. But I should, I, I should clarify something about homeschooling. Okay. In the sense of, in the legality sense. I'm, I'm happy that Connecticut is still one of the, I would say, least interfering states in terms of homeschooling. Oh, and, and, oh and, I didn't know that. And I say this as encouragement to people. Um, in the, the way homeschooling works in Connecticut is there's, there's basically two paths you can go. There's the path where you can follow a whole bunch of regulations and all sorts of, you know, you're going to submit a portfolio, you're going to meet with a local town official, and you're going to do this, this, and this. And basically, you're, you're going you're gonna to have a bureaucrat in your life while you're educating your kids on your own. That's, that's one path. And then the second path is you can simply just, you know, write a one-sentence letter to the school system and say, I'm removing my kid from the school system. See you later. Uh, and when you do this, the, the, the part that not everybody understands that, the, that, the, uh, that a, a, a school administrator may even try to deceive you on, they really, they really didn't push too hard in this town, I think, because I made it clear that I, I, I understood what was going on. They'll try to tell you that the first path you have to do. Okay, great. You want to homeschool? Here's the stack of paperwork you got to do. That's entirely voluntary um, in Connecticut, and I'm pleased to say. Okay, uh, so you can. I, I, I want to make this clear here. So there is this bureaucratic nightmare path, which I, I wouldn't I, even I, call it a nightmare because some people do it and they're happy with it because they want that attention. Oh, so, so it's a supportive thing more. Well, it's intended to be a supportive thing, but it's it also intended to be a control thing. All right, well, so let's put that aside because that, this yeah. is what I imagine it as. Yep. You're telling me, like, so you had your first kid and he's about to get to school age. You wrote El Header, I'm removing my kid from school? Mm -hmm. There's a, I mean, it was like, you know, I referenced a particular statute that says, I, I, I'm going to draw this from memory, I think it's section 10-184 
of the Connecticut General Statutes that clearly states that it is the responsibility of parents or guardians to educate children. And then it goes on to say, you can choose to put your kids in the public school system or not, essentially. And, and basically, the letter I wrote to the school system says, you know, according to, you know, Section 10-184, we're removing our kids from the school system effective immediately. End of story. So have does, a nice life, and that's it. At, at some point, is there, like, I, you have to, your, your kids have to go to a public place to do a test? I mean, Nothing. what? Nothing. No. no. This is in Connecticut. This varies wildly by states. I understand. Let me, some states are pretty authoritarian about homeschooling. How do you get, how did your, um, how do your kids, how would they go to college if they want to go to college? Um, well, sometimes you need a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. I mean, would they there's, have to get a GED? There's entrance exams at colleges. You write essays to get into colleges. You interview with, a, um, with an admissions officer to get into college. So as an individual, you, you get in front of a, another person and you state your case of why you should go to this college. I mean, I didn't graduate from high school. Yeah. I went to college because I, I dropped out of high school month later, I took the GED test, I passed it, and then I went to college. Mm -hmm. So that, that you can do, but so, so it's true. I just find that, I, I'm, that, I'm really pleased to hear that. I didn't realize because cause I, I listen to a lot of you know, podcasts and read other shows, and they're off in other states, and they're talking about homeschooling. They bring it up, and they're like, oh, this is terrible. Now they're trying to force this on mm -hmm. me. Now here, I, I didn't realize it was like that in Connecticut. Here's the thing. Um, I think the reason why that's still like that in Connecticut is not because of any particular benevolence or wisdom in Hartford. It's because homeschooling is up and coming in Connecticut. And there's a lot of people doing it, but if you go back 20 years, there was not many people doing it. It was even behind the curve on some other more rural states that had a stronger tradition of, of you know, of family education. Oh, that, there's also a difference because so, in the more in the, in the say the southern states, there's a strong tradition of a religiously based. Homeschooling, yep. and in yep. Connecticut, that's not such a strong thing. It's not. There's yeah, not as many there people. There is. There is that. There is a lot of that. From my experience, most of the homeschooling that is happening in Connecticut is still religious based. Hmm. Um, but for whatever reason, homeschooling has flown. I think it's just flown below the radar. Hmm. And but there are plen There are. It, it comes up on a fairly regular basis every time the legislature's in session. Somebody wants to insert their muddy little grubby authoritarian hooks into homeschoolers and you know I'm hopeful that homeschooling is going to be one of those things that it can be another turning point to get people to understand that it's okay to say no to say to say screw you you know you don't own my children and no I'm not going to submit a one page of paperwork to you and and, you know, and don't set foot on my property. Yeah, and I'm certainly I, not going to give you my kids for, right. for four. That's crazy. I, I think I'm encouraged. Like, you know, like when the gun control laws were passed and a whole bunch of people just basically didn't comply. I'm hopeful that the homeschooling movement will stand its ground in that sense as well and say, no, you know, we're, you know, we are not, you know, you do not own our children. You do not own my children. Um, I'm going to continue to educate them as I see best fit, and you need to leave me the hell alone. So... 52 minutes we're at, so then maybe we do have enough time. I'll just finish this last quote, and then we'll end on that. Um, so, again, all the seven lessons of the school teacher. I think there's a good paragraph from John's book, from John Gatto's book, that sort of summarizes it. The heart of a defense for the cherished American ideals of privacy, variety, and individuality lies in the way we bring up our young. Children learn what they live. Put kids in a class, and they will live out their lives in an invisible cage isolated from their chance at community. Interrupt kids with bells and horns all the time and they will learn that nothing is important. Force them to plead for the natural right to the toilet and they will become liars and toadies. Ridicule them and they will retreat from human association. Shame them and they will find a hundred ways to get even. The habits taught in large-scale organizations are deadly. So we're just about coming up on our, our timeout. I think that's a good place to end. Uh, I hope you guys have... Uh, have have enjoyed this discussion and maybe given you a little bit to think about. Um, you can look for us at Local Liberty on YouTube, Local Liberty on Facebook. Our email is localliberty.ct at gmail.com. Uh, I am Brian Saucier, and this is Shane Goodrich. Thanks very much for listening, and we will see you at the same time next week. Mm -hmm.